Hello and welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 217. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Hey, good morning, Mike. Good morning, Moonshots family, as well as our members and listeners. We are kicking off a brand new, exciting series today, Mike, aren't we? We certainly are. It's uh, it's a new show, new series, and it is one that is so close to my heart. So I cannot wait to get stuck in. Yeah, I think you're right. You're totally speaking for myself as well as the rest of the Moonshots team uh, there, Mike, because listeners and subscribers, we are diving into product discovery. We are not only kicking off a brand new show that's going to be full of interesting case studies, methodologies, and frameworks of ways of working, but today we're going to get inspired by the man himself, the author and founder of the SVPG group, Marty Kagan, who wrote a book, Inspired, How to Create Tech Products That Customers Love. Mike, this is kind of the go-to book, I would say, for uh, technology product managers, as well as a lot of us who work in, uh, I guess you could say, deliverable-based or product-based businesses, particularly when it comes to creating something that customers want, something that will matter to customers, right? Absolutely. I think you couldn't start a series on building new products better than with Marty Kagan's Inspired. And the reason is, Mark, he does such a fabulous job of painting what we need to do with our customers on the art side, but also not to be forgotten is how we need to work and build team on the inside. And this is quite rare because if you look at a lot of great works on building product, such as Lean Startup, that's mostly focused on the skills and working with the end user. What Marty threads into that kind of lean approach is the capacity to build a great team on the inside. And as you know, Mark, we continually study what it takes for real experts, moonshotters, people who do amazing things. It is in part how they work on the outside, how they understand needs in the market, but also how they work with their teammates, with their colleagues, and how they work on themselves. And all of that is in front of us in studying the work of Marty Kagan. Mark, I think it is a fabulous way to start this series. Yeah, I really can't wait. As you say, there's call outs that we're going to run into with entrepreneurs that we've studied on the show, such as, you know, James Dyson, Stephen Covey, but also Mike, I'm getting a little bit of Neil Pasricha and happiness and collaboration mm. and so on. So I would say that if you're looking to get inspired to create new products, but also to find good ways of working, I think Mike, we've got a bit of a package in store for listeners today. I agree. And we have, for those who are quick fingered, we're going to have uh, five giveaways later in the show as well. So if you're into product, you better stay tuned. But enough of the chit chat, Mark, where are we going to kick this off? We got to kick off with Marty himself, don't we, Mike? So let's start not only today's show with Marty's book, Inspired, but also we're going to kick off the new series on product discovery by hearing from Marty Kagan and how low-tech solutions can often be the path to innovation. In waterfall ways of working, and I would argue most of you are almost certainly still doing that, in waterfall way of working, the product, usually somebody in marketing or the business comes up with some requirements for the business, and then, but eventually it goes to a product manager type person, and they define requirements. That might be in some form of spec. It's usually in the form of user stories. And then that product manager will go to a designer and say, okay, here's what I need. They usually help them, quote, by providing some wireframes. But they go to the designer and they say, design me a solution to this. And then uh, the product manager and designer now will go to the engineers, usually at sprint planning, and say, this is what we need built. Just to be very clear, that is literally waterfall. If that is how you're working, that is clearly waterfall. I don't care if you call yourself agile. This is not meaningful agile. And more importantly, forget agile. It's not, you won't get innovation. Now, why won't you? Because 
The little secret in product is the best single source of innovation is our engineers. And in that way of working, you're getting less than half their value. The, why, the fundamental reason and what we've learned and why we design collaboratively is because the technology, the enabling technology, drives the functionality as much as functionality drives technology. The technology drives design as much as design drives technology. They are completely intertwined. This is also why one of the most important things you can do to succeed in a, pro a modern product team is to make sure the product manager, the product designer, and the senior engineer, we usually refer to as tech lead, sit that close together. It's incredibly low tech, but huge difference. And I will tell you, a lot of companies are trying to make it so that they can innovate without those three setting together. It's really hard. It's not impossible, but you have just taken your chances of success way down if those three are not sitting right next to each other. Uh, listen, I cannot agree more with the idea that technology drives design and design drives technology. I mm. think, Mark, I cannot tell you how many times I've seen really simple things like a multidisciplinary team sitting together, and here's the key bit, from the start. You know, what Marty was pointing out there is often somebody goes and dreams up a product in isolation and then gives it to a designer who gives it to a product manager who, give, who then gives it to the engineer like a, like a relay race, like a baton race. But all of those stakeholders need to be working on the problem from the start. And if we're mm -hmm. doing it, in that sort of baton old relay race manner, we are working in a method that we call waterfall, which is really old school, not very collaborative. And it's really flawed because it assumes that you're going to know exactly your requirements at the beginning. And it really doesn't have a focus on testing with users. Mm. However, what I also love, Mark, is it's so so low tech in Marty's advice there. He's like, guys, just get everyone sitting together in the same room, working on the same thing. Whilst it does sound like, is it that easy? It really is. But isn't it crazy how many teams don't work like that, Mark? Well, 100%. And there's been times in my career where that baton moment where you pass from, let's say one team to the next, it fumbles, it gets dropped. Sometimes, Mike, you have to go back a few paces. And how frustrating is it when you are trying to brief another team within your organization on something that maybe you've decided with, um, with a partner or other colleagues internally by yourself in isolation to, let's say, the product engineers, as Marty is calling out, that then need to be taken on the journey and by not including those, let's call them passengers, those teammates on the journey from day one, you're adding actually quite a lot of work in my experience to that process of getting yourself from initiation to product design, because you have to go back and retrace a lot of steps. You might even have to redo some of the work that's been decided upon with regards to maybe infrastructure or usability and so on. Isn't it frustrating, Mike? How many times for you have you run into moments when you kind of wish we'd had, uh, you know, individual X in the meeting back with the client or back with the teammates, you know, two weeks or maybe two months prior to them getting in the room at the end? It's crazy, like getting people up to speed or onboarding them mm into here's what we're thinking of. It is such an undermated, like then get, getting them to switch into your idea is such an underestimated practice. And they just don't have the context. They just don't, they need to like kind of warm up a little bit to understand like where are we trying to go with this? But here's the other thing I'd like to build on from what you were saying. And this is, this is fascinating. At the origin moment, of a great idea for a product. It is never as simple as someone goes, oh, we should do X, Y, and Z. And everyone mm. is around the table and just nods and says, yeah, that's phenomenal. No, it's much more organic and 
iterative. It's like Mark says, how about we think about this? And I'm like, yeah, that's good. Maybe we could do this. And then the engineer jumps in and says, oh, I saw this thing. And you do several rounds of that collaboration, that ideation. And sometimes you go off track, you come back on track, but then you always end up much further than where you were at the original suggestion and much better. If you don't have that moment of everyone together in those key origin moments of a product, then basically everything downstream of that, nobody is building on the idea. Everybody's just trying to catch up to what is it that you guys want? And then, okay, I'll just do it like this. So you you end up building what's in the work order mm. rather than saying what would be the best thing to build. And that's what happens when you get people together. You ask better questions. What would be compelling for our users, for our stakeholders, rather than like, I don't understand and you guys are already halfway through the process. I'm just trying to catch up. So rather than that, get everyone together. It is sage like simple advice, Yeah, <laughs> but it's so crazy how rare it happens, isn't it, Mark? Well, and, and exactly to your point, Mike, it is low tech. It's su- this is such a practical piece of advice. It's kicking off our product discovery series. We could almost hang up our hats, Mike, and say, I think we might be nearly done because <laughs> it's so, it's so simple, but something that we totally uh, don't prioritize doing because we are all trying to make the most use of our time. We're trying to do everything yes. so, so fast. Instead, yeah. it's taking a moment, taking a beat, bringing everybody up to speed on the journey with you so that you can define that end destination a little bit sooner and a little bit easier. Yeah. And I, but I, I will say this, I tell you who we are aligned with Mark and that's our members. They are on the same page. They are learning out loud. They are pushing the envelope. They want to be the best version of themselves. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, I totally agree. And so in terms of discovering and calling out our key members, our supporters every week, please welcome dun, 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 Bob, John, Terry, Ken, Dietmar, Marjan, Connor, Lisa, Sid, Mr. Bonjour, Paul, Berg, and Kalman, our annual members. It's good that we're now uh, adding more and more individuals to this list, Mike. It's great to see our longest lasting individuals grow week on week. So thank mm. you very much for your continued support, guys. But that's not to, to say we don't love all of the rest of our listeners as well and members who support us, including David, Joe, Crystal and Ivo, Christian, Samuela, Kelly, Barbara, Andre, Matthew, Eric and Abby, Chris, Deborah, Lassie and Steve, Craig, Daniel, Andrew and Ravi, Yvette and Karen, Raul, PJ, Nikuara and Ola, Ingram, Dirk, Emily, Hari, Karthik, Venkata, Vipara and Marco, Sundus, Jet, Pablo and Roger, Steph, Gabia and our brand new member, Anna. Thank you so much for continually supporting us week in, week out, guys. It is not uh, something that we uh, take for granted. We appreciate your continual support and you help us keep the lights on. We are super grateful to you. And now in honor of our members, we're going to switch gears. We're going to ramp up from that low tech solution. We're going to get high tech. We're going to get strategic as we listen to Marty Kagan. It's still hard to do a product strategy, and I think it's because uh, it requires four things, all four of which are hard for most companies. The first thing it requires is focus, which, of course, is no surprise, but um, many, most leadership teams really struggle to focus. They think they're focused if they're pursuing 30, 40, 50 initiatives for the year. They think that's focused because They're only pursuing 30, 40, 50. They're not pursuing the 200 that they would like to do. So, and I have to point out to them, that is not really what we mean by focus. You are an order of magnitude off. Focus is really about picking the few things. Honestly, it's typically two or three that really make a difference for a company. And that may be things like doubling revenue or increasing our uh, retention of our customers or reducing the churn, same idea. But there's a few things that really make a difference. And so the first thing that's important for a strategy is focus. And as you know, especially because so many executives live by this fear of missing out, FOMO, that They see all these things going on in the world and they want to try a little bit on all of them so that maybe one of them really hits. Of course, that's uh, that's not a recipe for success. 
So the first issue is focus why. That's one thing that's hard. The second thing that's hard is, is product strategy. So you've narrowed it down to two or three really important things for the company. And now it's based on insights. We have to use our insights to tell us the best way to f- focus our efforts and solve these problems. Now, those insights can come from quantitative. Uh, they, they, they very often do from an analysis of the data. They can come from qualitative, like talking to our customers. They can come from in new enabling technologies. They can come from major industry trends. They can come from lots of different places. But this is another thing that most companies are not good at because they're not used to the model where they have to generate insights like this on an ongoing basis. They're used to the model where they just try to serve as many stakeholders as they can. All right. So that's the second thing they struggle with. And insights really are the key to an effective product strategy. Then the third thing product strategy requires is, you know, the purpose of the insights and the focus is to narrow down the set of problems that we need our product teams to tackle. And then we have to assign those problems to specific product teams. And of course, that's very different than how the old IT style works, where you'd give them a bunch of features to build in a roadmap. Instead, we're saying, no, you have to give them a set of problems to solve. And that's at a higher level. And this is really where empowerment comes from. An empowered product team means they're given a problem to solve, not a feature to build. And they get to figure out the best way to solve that problem. Uh, And then the final fourth uh, thing that companies struggle with is um, it, it still requires management because things, as soon as a strategy is really being executed, you know, first of all, some teams make faster progress than others, and the world changes. Somebody acquires something, or a developer leaves, or you have a dependency you didn't realize. There's a thousand things that come up, and a good strategy requires active management. But here's the key. You don't want to undermine that empowerment you just did by giving people teams problems to solve by micromanaging them. So the fourth thing it requires that's hard for most companies is managers that understand this idea of servant leadership or basically they are there to help remove obstacles, chase down impediments, whatever is needed, but they're not there to take over and say, let me drive. Wow, Mike, we are hearing some sage, sage wisdom and advice from Marty in that clip. I mean, we could, again, we could probably hang up our hats and say product discovery tick (laughs) after hearing those four steps. There is a whole show Uh, And what we just heard from Marty, here's a question though for you, Mark. Out of those four, Mm. focusing, uh, thinking about product strategy, focus, insights, empowerment, and servant leadership, which do you think is the hardest for organizations to do? Focus, insights, empowerment, servant leadership. I I think it's going to be insights. Because I think the, and, and uh, t- as a reminder for our listeners, what Marty's calling out with insights is a uh, quantum qualitative research, maybe looking at industry trends, maybe competitive analysis and so on. I think what I believe, Mike, is that a lot of companies and a lot of teams will perhaps deprioritize the importance of insights in favor of meeting deadlines in favor of creating that next product feature or the next release in the roadmap, they will deprioritize those insights, that insight phase, because they want to try and hit their targets. And I think that's that's where I'm leaning towards. And it's p- actually probably the most fun piece, <laughs> isn't it, Mike? As, yeah, we'll, as we'll discuss more today. What about you, Mike? Which of those four key steps that Marty's calling out for product strategy do you think is going to be the hardest? Yeah. So look, you might be fortunate to have like a a great manager or a leader and maybe the external events are driving you to, to a level of focus for your product strategy. But I think the insights that you mentioned and leadership that is prepared to empower teams, like guys, here's the problem we need to solve. You guys go and work on the best 
approach to solving that. I think that's kind of rare. In fact, as, as you were talking and I was processing through what Marty said, invariably I think what we do is prioritize delighting our internal stakeholders above and beyond delighting our customers. And I think it's very easy to fall in this trap, Mark, because mm. if you are working with people, seeing people at the water cooler, having lunch with them, and they have needs within the organization, it's easy. It's so visceral. You see real humans. But invariably, a lot of companies don't spend too much time with their customers, either looking at the data or in person. And so as a result, the customer becomes a bit abstracted. So we end up prioritizing the people that we see in the hallway at the office and not the people that matter just as much. And that's the customers who are out there actually using the product, paying for the product. I think that's invariably why product strategy becomes so hard. We fall into this terrible habit of pleasing those around us on our mm. team rather than the customer, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, I think you're totally right. Again, calling back to the idea of KPIs and the um, the idea of feeling like you're really busy and the idea that you're being productive. I think you, you've hit the nail on the head, Mike. We are trying to uh, maybe not pander, but we have a, a priority that's perhaps the wrong way around. We're trying to improve and show our bosses that we're hitting those targets rather than the other way around, which is actually servicing those customers who fundamentally are keeping the lights on, paying the bills and using the products. So I think you're totally right. And But isn't that a, a key insight straight away from Marty? Because of the fact that we deprioritize it, we might end up creating and therefore spending products, money, as well as our time building features or functionality that actually the customers don't really mind. They don't really care about because instead we've told ourselves, oh, yeah. this is the priority to go and make. Yeah. I mean, think about the Amazon Fire Phone, the Segway, the Microsoft Zoom. These are all products that didn't solve the problem for the end user, but those were large organizations that somehow fell in love with, built mm. and launched things that customers just simply didn't want. And that's the truth. And here's the other thing, and this is sort of the gray area in the middle, Mark. Let's say you launch something that's okay. And it kind of does the job for the customers, but maybe you threw in a few features that your boss really likes. Here's the thing. The most expensive product experience you can have as a builder of products is trying to fix a product once it's live, once you've deployed it. And it's think about going from the sandbox into production being live. Maybe you're in an app store, maybe you're on a browser. You've got hundreds and if you're lucky, thousands of uh, users on the platform. And then you need to start changing things because customers are complaining about the way a product is working. And then trying to, I mean, it's a great analogy of trying to fly the plane while you build it. Yeah. And it's very expensive and you instantly get into this spiral of defense. Oh, mm -hmm. we're fixing this. We can't fix it all now. So we'll just push this release and then we'll come back to the other stuff. And you know what's happened? Your roadmap, your dreams, your visions of product utopia, they're gone. You're already chasing the game. You're behind because you're fixing stuff you already put live. So what's crazy is that only really seasoned product creators, developers, really experienced product owners know this pain and will try to prevent the organization repeating these mistakes because it is so costly to them. Yet, here's the thing rarely are we truly focused on meeting the needs of the customer and rarely are we all sitting together from the beginning just in mm. those two things. I mean, Marty has given us so much illumination on how we might build a great product. And Mark, here's the thing. He ain't finished, is he? 
No, that's right. We're now going to hear David from Eritus, who's going to break down Marty's three key principles to help us in that next stage, Mike, which is all about the principles to build the best team. Product teams are always looking for a silver bullet to create better products. In their search for the magic answer, many teams adopt work methods like lean and agile. The lean and agile methods are effective, but some teams go overboard with them. In this book, Inspired, Marty Kagan lays out three simple overarching principles you can focus on to optimize your work and to create better products. The first principle is to always tackle risk sooner rather than later. Too many teams waste time and money building something before they assess their product's risk. Before you build a product, make sure you've answered these questions. Will customers buy it? Will customers be able to use it easily? Can your engineers build the product with the skills and resources they have? And finally, does the product work for other aspects of your business like sales and marketing, finance and legal? The second principle is to define and design products collaboratively instead of sequentially. On traditional product teams, a product manager defines the product requirements, then the designer designs a solution, and the engineers build a solution. They work sequentially. Instead, have your product design and engineering teams work together in a give and take kind of way. Strong teams work collaboratively to create solutions that their customers love. The third principle is to focus on solving problems instead of implementing features. Traditional product teams concentrate on output, but great output doesn't always solve the underlying problems you're trying to address. The strongest product teams focus on solving their customers' problems and achieving meaningful business results. So solving problems for me is so important here, Mark, because if you're focused on solving the problem that the customer experiences, you can actually make that really black and white. Okay. So let's say the customer wants to have an amazing adventure holiday. Let's say the customer wants to lose 20 pounds so they can look and feel great. This is a clear problem statement that you can go and build a product around. And there's many different ways to do it. And how many times, I mean, we mentioned, you know, some of those famous product failures, but how many times do we use product? For example, let me, let me just hit you with one that I was doing yesterday. I was uh, provided a, a purchase order number. And so I was submitting the invoice that relates to the purchase order number. And check this out. The system is for an international company. Um, and every time, I have uh, tried to invoice uh, this international company, the procurement system will not allow me to actually put the exchange uh, currency uh, Mm. for the invoice in. And every single time I need to raise a ticket with their tech support and they manually go in the back end and fix it. This, (laughs) whoever (laughs) built this procurement system, wasn't focused on the problem, which is people need to submit their invoices against one of our POs. And so what happens though, here's the cost to their organization. They have a help desk that manually fixes it every single time. So it's actually costing them money because they didn't focus on the user's needs or in this case, my needs, because I just want to put up the invoice against the PO. This is this was just happening to me yesterday. How many times, Mark, do you jump into a product and notice how many weird quirks that you have to go through just to get your job done? And to me, that's a sign that the product builder wasn't focused on the problems that you're trying to solve. Yeah, you're totally right, Mike. And that sounds exactly like the pilots or the passengers on the plane are trying to fix it while it's (laughs) mid-flight. And how efficient does that feel and sound? Me, it happens a lot, particularly since this is such an interesting area that I love to, to learn about. When I'm using a product, whether it's a digital one or maybe it's physical, I will notice those moments when the customer experience feels a bit wonky. You know, when I'm having to input information that I've already tried 
to input previously. I was trying to make a booking on on, on uh, you know an international website the other day, and it kept on asking, and I had to put in my personal information and so on. And it had one of those classic error boxes, you know, where you've got to put in information. You know, oh, you haven't put in your mm-hmm. email, or mm-hmm. your telephone number, and so on. There was a box, and it required a field. It, it was a field that required some information. I, I put in some information. It was rejected. Okay, I'll scroll up to the box to see what what it needs me to do. No further information. Just a red outline <laughs> around the field. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess maybe I need to enter the data in another way. So I tried again. Error. And I'm sitting there scratching my head, thinking, "Don't they want me to to book?" Don't they want me yeah. to pay do for they this want product? My money? <laughs> I, I, I physically don't know what to do next. So then I'm online. I'm having to think about getting in touch with them, their contact information and so on. And at this point, I'm thinking, I don't know whether I, I care enough for this. And suddenly that breakdown for a customer experience who's at this point, they're about to purchase your product, but that legacy system that probably was built you know, a long, long time ago. And exactly to your experience with raising the PO, it's something that the business knows need fixing, but it's on nobody's priority list right now. And they've got a band-aid solution. They've got the tech team who are there to help customers whenever they do struggle, run into this particular problem, which again, everybody's probably aware of, and they're just deprioritizing week on, week out. It doesn't make sense for the end user, i.e. me or you. And instead of solving that customer problem, it's the Band-Aid solution that gets pushed back again and again and again. But how frustrating, Mike, is it for a customer when you do run into moments that you just think the business haven't really cared for me? They haven't really tried to create an efficient solution. And therefore, I'm kind of falling out of love with them. It's damaging, isn't it? it, Exactly. And think about the cost of of what I was um, uh, sharing with you is they they literally have to have a team of humans augmenting the application in order to help people complete the tasks that they're trying to get yeah. done, which sounds, it's just crazy to think that that's how they are set up. They've accepted how big this gap is between what they've built and what actually the user needs. So now they need a help desk and they have all these international numbers you can call. (laughs) You're like, oh my (laughs) gosh. And this is really the true cost of building Mm. bad product because then you actually have all these, if you will, coping mechanisms to, you know, Band-Aid here, Band-Aid there, we'll get it across the line. It wasn't glamorous, but it kind of works. The difference is like, just think about like your checkout experience with Amazon. It's invisible. Think about your checkout experience with Uber. You don't even need to get out your credit card. It's things like these, which are the little magic moments in product that really help you stand apart. So this is to me like such a huge lesson that we can take from Marty. And we've got so much more from Marty to come. I think the key thing I want to stress here is that there is a world of product coming up with the idea, creating the team, building the first iteration, learning and learning. And if you're thinking that you'd like to get into this world, of maybe you've got an idea and you really want to kick the tires first before you build it. We have a giveaway for all of you listeners. For the first five people that send an email to hello at moonshots.io, you are going to get for free a product discovery course from us, actually from my company, Apollo Advisors. And it is a big deep dive into not only the themes of Marty, but many others on how you can take your idea and turn it into a successful product. You're going to get it all for free. So usually my corporate clients are the only ones that get to use this, but you, our listeners, will get to do it. So jump on, hit the email, hello at moonshots.io, and you'll be able to learn how to turn your idea into a killer product. So the first five people are going to get their hands on that very in-depth course on product discovery. We are given a lot of value today, Mark. (laughs) <laughs> You're totally right, Mike. But it doesn't stop there. As you'll find out through the product discovery course for those lucky five who are the quickest uh, fingers in the West who will get access to the course, there's one key step that is really, really important 
valuable and I would say, Mike, somewhat essential when it comes to the creation of products, but also in that early stage when you are defining and discovering the product. And that's the idea of prototypes. So the next thing we're going to hear is from Marty Kagan, who's going to introduce this idea of prototyping and what he calls the two-week rule. Two-week rule is because I spend a lot of time arguing with product owners and designers especially, uh, trying to convince them to take their product ideas and put them out in front of customers fast, generally well before they're comfortable doing that. I understand where they're coming from. There's a natural tendency to want to get your product just right before you show it to the world, and you're worried that if something doesn't go right, that's why, because it wasn't just right. But, um, but I've learned a long time ago that the first real learning starts when you put something in front of users. And I've also learned a long time ago that product people tend to fall in love with their ideas really quickly. And when they fall in love, they start, as they say, love is blind. And you start ignoring the reality, ignoring the feedback, uh, which is really detrimental in a product team. So I argue that they need to get their product ideas in front of users in no more than two weeks. In general, I'm a big advocate of high fidelity prototypes, either user prototypes or live data prototypes. Uh, And I believe that's our best way to learn quickly. However, that said, if they're not ready and two weeks are up, I'm an advocate to take whatever you have, whether it's a paper prototype or a balsamic prototype, and put it in front of users. The, the value of the learning early will more than offset the limitations of the lower fidelity prototype. This is a critical uh, skill for all product teams and, and just getting comfortable with putting your ideas out quickly. Oh, he is preaching to the choir. Get your ideas Mm -hmm. in front of customers. I love this. I am such an advocate of prototyping pen, paper, on the whiteboard, whatever it takes. This feedback from the end user is gold, gold, gold. And this kind of leads us into a bigger idea of thinking, which is you really need to put testing with users, not only the heart at the heart of your product discovery, your product development, but it should be an ongoing way to actually build great products. So let's follow this up with another thought from Marty on users. I argue that a user test is probably the single most important thing that a product owner does in their job. A user test is basically two parts, and it's in this order intentionally. The first part is meant to answer the question, can they figure out how to use your product? The second part is meant to answer the question, Okay, now that they know how to use the product, would they use the product? And if not, what would it take to get this person to actually want to buy the product? The first part is really essentially a usability test. Uh, As such, the product owner and uh, hopefully the designer and the engineer, if at all possible, are all watching that usability test. Typically, uh, it's moderated by a user researcher if you have a user researcher. Otherwise, it's the designer that typically moderates the the usability test component. very good to do, very easy to do, and the learnings are very quick and, and the benefits come fast. That You should view that as the warm-up. The real benefit of a user test is the second part, uh, also known as the value test. This is where we're trying to figure out, now that they actually understand what this product is and what it does, now you can have a really informed, useful conversation about would they actually use it? Would they actually buy it? And I'm very often I'll tell you the answer is no, uh, or maybe, which is essentially no. And what you want to know is what would it take in order to get them? Now, a lot of people just ask the, uh, ask the, the user you're testing, would they buy it? And they say something like probably or yes, and, and they are very happy and they go back and celebrate. One question I love to ask is the net promoter score question, which is on a scale of 0 to 10, how likely would you be to recommend this product to your colleagues? And unless they say 9 or 10, they basically mean they're being polite is what's going on. They usually give you an answer like 5, 6, or 7 when you're just getting going. But when you when they say 9 or 10, they mean it, generally. There are other techniques we have to assess value. But overall, you don't want to leave that test until you know the answer to that question deeply. Would they choose to buy 
buy that product, and if not, why not? At this point, it's not the uh, user researcher that's facilitating. Now the product owner takes over. They are actually driving on this question and following the, line, the discussion to try to get to an answer to that question. Once you've actually done that value test, or while you're even doing that value test, you need to be really open to what we call the pivot. Uh, you may decide through the course of this dialogue about what it would take for them to use it that, first of all, you may decide it's the wrong customer. There's somebody else in that business that, that actually needs your help. Or you might decide that you're really solving the wrong problem for them. If you just adjust the problem you're solving to what really where their pain is, you've got a much more valuable product on your hands. Very often what we decide is that the uh, solution you have has got the wrong approach and you need to take a different tack at solving that problem for that, that customer. And sometimes we find that it's the monetization strategy that's wrong and that if you just adjust that strategy, you'll have much more success. Be very open to those pivots. They're often the key to a big win. Mike, this idea of being open to change and specifically as Marty's calling out the idea of pivoting based on you know, customer feedback around, can they use your product? Would they? Is uh, right in line with what we were learning from Sir James Dyson and how his approach to engineering is not only about solving a problem, you know, looking at it, figuring out how it can be improved. You know, he sees a gap, but also the fact that progress comes from uh, small improvements over time and tracking failures. I think this is a big uh, idea around product discovery, which is the iterate, iterative process of refining slowly over time, putting it back in front of a customer. As Marty called out, a very simple way of doing it is like an MPS, net promoter score, a bit of quant. How highly does a customer rate it? Okay. Very, very simple uh, dipstick to put in to see how customers are reacting to it. To then be able to build on let's call it second order thinking, I suppose, to a certain extent, if mm. they are going to use it and this is how they react, what might they expect next? Is this what they want to see? Okay, well, let's put it in front of them. This is really talking to the uh, enjoyable aspect of rapid prototyping, isn't it? Well, it's not only speaking to that. In addition, it's speaking to the fact that this is a continuous, ongoing, iterative process, and it is not lightning striking once. Mm. Like, I think that's the biggest problem that a lot of sort of newbies to product development, product design have is they think, oh, I've got an idea. I'll just make that. No, it's like, I've got a sense that there's a problem and maybe there's a particular way to solve that problem. I'm going to go on a long journey to get to the right answer here. And this is why it's okay for it to be wrong or not working or to fail, particularly at the beginning, because that's a great chance to get some understanding of how to make it work. And this all led us up into this big idea. And this is the final idea that we have from Marty, which is don't be obsessed with what you think is the answer. Don't have those assumptions. Don't have the wishful thinking, but rather fall in love with the problem. What you want to do as a founder is not fall in love with your solution, but fall in love with the problem. And this is the sad part. He was working on a very worthy problem. But instead of trying in three years, realistically, he could have tried more than a hundred approaches. He should have tried more than a hundred approaches. Now, it's a very hard problem he's working on, so there's no guarantees that even with a hundred attempts, he would have solved it, but he would have had a much better chance than trying what? And this is so important to understand that as long as we solve the problem, that's just discovery. We iterate all the time. Sometimes we change our approach. Sometimes we improve the current solution, but we're constantly trying. And the thought that you could persist for three years with the same solution and not realize it's time to try another approach. In fact, one of my friends, Teresa Torres, many of you probably know Teresa, she wrote a very good book recently called Continuous Discovery Habits. And if you haven't read it, I would 
encourage you to. Um, and Teresa loves a technique. I believe she came up with it. I'm not sure, but she taught me the technique, and it's called opportunity solution trees. And it's not a big deal. It's actually a very simple technique. That's one of the reasons I love it. But it's meant to prevent this problem. If that startup team had done a solution tree, what it really makes you do is realize right at the beginning that there are many different ways we could approach this problem. And if the first one doesn't work after a few weeks, let's try another one. They would have had that in front of them, and it would have given them a mindset that had a, the right, the focus on the problem, not on their particular idea for a solution. But we all know many founders fall in love with their solution. I mean, a lot of them have been dreaming about that solution for years, and they finally get some money to pursue it. And it's very dangerous to fall in love with the solution. Mike. I think what's fascinating as we are in a series all about product and defining uh, technology, essentially, we're now hearing about mindset again, this idea of being, oh my gosh, the idea of learning as you go and how important it is to just take a breath, appreciate the journey that you're going on. You're interacting with your customers. That's fun. You're coming up with new solutions. That's fun too. How great is it that we're once again hearing how important mindset is to product discovery? Well, you should be very careful here, Mark, because you'll get me blabbering on for hours about the relationship between skills and behavior. And if you want to build a great product, you can have the best idea in the land, but you also need to be the best teammate in the land. You need to be the best listener in the land. So I truly believe that great entrepreneurship takes personal transformation as well. And I think Marty unknowingly has tapped into the very core, the essence of Moonshots, hasn't he? Yeah, I think he has. And and Mike, as I reflect upon what we've learned already from Marty today with his book, Inspired, as well as how we started the product discovery series, I think falling in love with the problem is, is the key takeaway for me. It's the thing that then inspires me to go out and want to talk to customers, to want to focus, to want to empower myself as well as my colleagues around me. It's by falling in love with that product and reassessing our mindset. What about you? What's the, what's standing out to you today? Oh, I think I'm going to go right back to his first clip. Things are often solved with the discipline, not necessarily high tech, but low tech. Wasn't that pretty cool? That's pretty fun, isn't it? Just a reminder that we can go into breaking down those challenges in much simpler ways than perhaps we even thought possible. It's just about being open. His Mm. whole company is called Silicon Valley Product Group, and yet he's like, (laughs) let's go low tech on this. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, just start start from the from the scratch. I love it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So Mark, thank you to you and thank you to our members and our listeners. And don't forget, we're all about the exchange of value here. So if you want to get one of those free passes to our product discovery course, remember to email us at hello at moonshots.io and you'll be ready to practice exactly what we learned here in show 217 with Marty Kagan and his book Inspired. We learned about the power of low-tech solutions for customers and our teammates. We learned about what great product strategy looks like in those four key elements and it really comes back to focusing, obsessing about users, prototyping, testing with users in order to not implement your solution, but to fall in love with the problem so you can build a solution for the user. And if you do this, you'll be on the way to building a great product. And as you do that, you'll learn that you need to be the best version of yourself to accomplish that mission. And you can come here together with us, members, listeners, Mark and Mike, to learn out loud together, to really push the envelope, to shoot for the moon, because that's what we're all about here on the Moonshots podcast. That's a wrap.